I'd like to talk about comfort and comfort zones today, as well as the normal. Now, when I'm talking about comfort zones, I don't mean what a lot of people might think I mean. I don't mean, yeah, bro, that the reason why you're only making 95K a year is because you're not hauling ass to earn all that mad dough. You're in your comfort zone. You got to break out because that's why you're not a millionaire, you know, because you're in your comfort zone. And I think the most illustrative way I can talk about this notion of comfort zone and the normal is to bring up this example from last month. Many of you might have caught wind of this in New York City in the subway. You'll recall there's this mentally ill man who was harassing people and haranguing people, and this soldier, uh, Daniel Penny, put him in a chokehold and ended up slaying him, unintentionally, because he originally just wanted to stop the guy. This guy's named Jordan Neely, had a history of mental illness as well as aggression, misdemeanors, and I think some minor crimes as well, but don't quote me on that. And I wanted to bring this example up because there's something interesting about the New York City subway because that sort of behavior that you encounter there is very normal, what this Jordan Neely was doing, harassing people, haranguing people. It's very normal. There's a certain protocol that you get used to when you're riding the New York City subway. I learned it many, many moons ago, and it seems nothing has changed since then. You get on the subway, and you attempt to mind your own business. You stare down at the floor. Back in the day, you might read a newspaper. You might bring a book with you. You might listen to your Walkman way back in the day. These days, probably the same principle, though you might have your phone or an MP3 player with you or what have you. And you try to get through the ride. You try to get from A to B. What you would expect on any public form of transportation, you're trying to get somewhere after all. But... The level of desperation to stare at the floor, to make sure that you don't catch anyone's attention, to just mind your own business and get on with things, is on a level that is scarcely imaginable to people who are not denizens of New York City and who don't regularly ride the NYC subway system. Why? Well, this Jordan Neely chap was an example of somebody all too frequent that you encounter on the regular in NYC subway situations. They're often mentally ill. They're often on drugs. They're often alcoholics. They often have criminal backgrounds. And they like to scream and holler and harass you. Sometimes they're even violent. I could tell you stories going way back, late 80s, early 90s, of men and women walking into the subway, screaming, talking to the air, the gods, and dropping their trousers and defecating in the middle of the subway car. I still remember an incident from the 90s where a guy loudly proclaimed to everybody in the car that he was HIV positive and that he had a hypodermic needle with him, which he brandished in front of himself, showing all the passengers that he had it. The threat being, if you don't give me money, I'm going to stab you with this and infect you with HIV. There are dozens of stories I could tell you like this. Everything from crazy people harassing you, not leaving you alone, to actual violence. And that's the thing. That, everything I've just described, is totally normal in the context of a New York City subway. And that's the thing. Everything I've described is totally normal in the context of the New York City subway. If you're riding the train, trying to get from A to B to C to D you almost certainly will encounter something like this. And what happens? The first time, you're shocked. The second time, still shocked. Third time, eventually you get used to it. Eventually you become anesthetized to your environment. It becomes normal. You enter your comfort zone. It's not that you're comfortable with these lunatics and madmen and mad women in the subway. You're not. That's why you're staring as strenuously as possible at the bloody floor in the hopes that the guy doesn't assault you or scream at you or, God forbid, pull out a hypodermic needle to stab you. You're not comfortable with it, but you're comfortable enough such that you've come to accept that it's bloody normal. That's what I mean by comfort zone. That's the comfort zone a lot of people find themselves in. Is it normal? Well, it's all relative, right? 
If you're a denizen of NYC, unfortunately, you've come to accept that as normal. Mass amounts of mentally ill criminal people harassing you, perpetrating crimes when they feel like it, that's normal. But if you were to, say, walk through the capital of Finland, Helsinki, that would be very, very abnormal. It'd be very strange. Now, enter into the equation this guy, Daniel Penny, who put the guy in the chokehold, apparently originally from Long Island, which is a suburb of New York, probably was not as familiar with the New York City subway as an actual denizen of the five boroughs is typically. And on top of that, he's a military man. Okay. So he didn't see that as normal. This guy, Jordan Neely, harassing and haranguing people. He thought it was abnormal to the point where he suspected the guy was about to commit a violent act, which is why he intervened. You see how you have clashes of normalcy here. To denizens of NYC, this is normal. They don't like it, but it's their comfort zone because that's what they're stuck in. Somebody else comes from the outside sees that, what on earth is going on here? And the same thing can be said for anything. I mean, look at Skid Row in L.A. The confluence of some of the worst off people in all the United States with some of the most concentrated wealth in the United States in places like Hollywood and throughout L.A., that's normal there. European tourists go there and say, what on earth is this skid row? Look at all these tents and these people. They're just high as a kite. They're drunk off their buttocks. What is going on? They're not used to it. Why am I talking about this, though? Because normal is as normal does. Just because something is normal doesn't mean it's good. And I'm guilty of this, too. And this adds another element to it, right? The degree of comfort in that comfort zone, right? If things are really, really bad, you're more likely to act, right? If you are in a war zone, you need to get out of the way of the artillery fire, obviously, if you want to survive. If you have nothing to eat, you're going to be looking for food if you're actually starving. But if you're very discontented, maybe suffering a little bit, but it's not intolerable to the point where it would consume you, devour you, and outright destroy you, then you're much more likely to hang in that situation of the comfort zone. It's not great. It's not even good. It's pretty bad, but it's not so bad that it stirs you to action. That's what you can see in the NYC subway. That's what you can see in people's everyday lives. They have their comfort zone. They are not entirely content, but they're not so discontent and so beset by their circumstances that they're moved to action. That's the danger of the comfort zone. Not, bro, you're not a millionaire because you're in your comfort zone. You got to do this. You got to do that. I'm talking about ordinary people who have come to accept how rotten things are. Not absolutely horrifying because in those situations, you're probably moved to action, typically. It's just things are bad. And you can kind of tolerate and accept bad. But... It's not amazing, by no means. So rather than be moved to improve that situation, you just accept it and you try to deal with it and you try to get through the day. Many of us do this, myself included. The macroscopic projection of this phenomenon is the example I cited of the NYC subway. It's the perfect storm of this. Horrible, horrible, horrible thing to have to deal with But if you need to ride the subway to get from A to B, you have to put up with it and you come to accept it. Now, the question is what to do about it. Some people are capable of breaking out of this shell and acknowledging that these things, although borderline tolerable, sort of, are by no means good. Good doesn't necessarily mean normal, and normal doesn't necessarily mean good. It's simply what you're accustomed to. And I don't know how easy this is to change. Not everyone can even recognize this. If you come to accept a permanent situation, like many of the denizens of, say, NYC have with respect to the subway or the city itself, how crummy and horrible it is, then you're going to be blind to the reality of places outside of the city. You might go on a holiday somewhere and see something, but it's so alien And you're there for only so briefly that you can't really take it in and realize that, wow, there's a different life out there that isn't quite as crummy and miserable as this one. Fundamentally, 
at the individual level, it's a problem of good enough. Good enough isn't really good. You probably aren't entirely content with it, but it's serviceable and it's really, really hard to get out of that serviceable situation. And this is where all the gurus sweep in to offer you their sage wisdom for a price. Here's what you need to do to get out of the situation. You need to listen to me. You need to follow my precepts. You need to follow me. You need to listen to what I have to say. Is that a solution? Well, maybe. But the problem is with all this guruism, and you know how much I love gurus, is at the end of the day, you are the one stuck in your shoes. You, lone individual man. Gurus don't know you. They don't know your situation. Maybe it is a situation they can allegedly help you with. Maybe, but maybe it's not. But I think this realization, at least, of being stuck in a comfort zone that isn't particularly pleasant is something that can, at the very least, give you a new sense of awareness. And maybe, if you're lucky, some place to go that is not that comfort zone. As always, thank you for tuning in. Special thanks to my patrons. You guys are the best. Really appreciate the support. You keep the channel going. And special thanks to anyone who is a donor on PayPal. Really appreciate that support as well. And if you could please engage in the usual YouTube jazz of liking the video, subscribing if you're not yet a sub, leaving a comment, sharing the video. That would be greatly appreciated too. And if I'm still alive, I'll see you around next time. Until then, may the gods watch over you. Bye-bye for now. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.